Hi, I'm Dr. Gemma, and welcome back to Cognitive, the Knitting Psychology Podcast. Cheerfully and somewhat irregularly in business since 2008. Segments today may include what's on my hooks, needles, and spindles, a strategy, something I really like, put a lid on it, oh shoot, and blather. So sit back, put your feet up, pick up your knitting, crocheting, spinning, weaving, or dyeing, (laughs) or any other yarny thing you're doing, and get ready to enjoy. Well, hi there, it's Dr. Gemma, and welcome to episode 150, wow, of the new series of the Cognitive Podcast, and I am recording here today on October 1st, 2023, at about 8 p.m. Nice to have you all back. Your comments are very welcome. Remember that you can comment on the blog at cognitivepodcast.blogspot.com, or you can comment on our group on Ravelry. Please also be aware that I will not be adding you to my follower group on any social media because I keep getting hit by spammers and robo accounts. So you can follow me most easily either here on the blog at cognitivepodcast.blogspot.com or you can follow me over on Ravelry in our group where I post the show notes as well. In the Warm Thanks Department, of course, everybody supporting Cognitive Fiber Retreat 2023, alias hashtag CFR23, on Facebook and on Instagram, if we are all there together. This week, too, I want to thank Steffi Joe, who had this idea. She's going to bring acrylic yarns that can be used for Mother Bear for our yarn swap, and she was considering even assembling some Mother Bear kits out of that. What I love about that is we could all do that together. We could all bring in yarn and just start mixing and matching and creating bear kits. And it wouldn't be bad if we all did a bear along while we were at CFR 23, whatever. I'm not going to try to enforce anything like this, but it's just one more idea of something we could do. And I think it's a cool idea on Steffi Joe's part to assemble this stuff into little kits to make things from. I think it gives that feel of here's a real project you can do. I say this because I'm a serious scrap knitter and crocheter, and sometimes I feel like I'm not doing real projects. I'm just throwing junky stuff together. But I love, 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 love using my yarn scraps in these projects, either crocheting or knitting. Meanwhile, knit one, pug two. I'd like to tell you, hang in there with your craft closet project. Because knit one, pug two is doing with her craft closet something like my project G. All I can tell you is, as the wonderful Benjamin Franklin said, and you know I love me some Ben Franklin, little strokes fell great oaks. And then TST, Tiny Shiny Things, jumped in with a really interesting comment about micro breaks and chronic pain. And it was in the direction of if you have chronic pain, you really get the idea of micro breaks and you kind of have to. And I think that's really key because one of the things that's striking to me is how I was told that men do things in one fell swoop in big projects and women do things by multitasking. So some male psychologists studied this and said, well, of course, multitasking is less efficient. And that leads me, when I look at Tiny Shiny Things, very intelligent comment to say, uh, hello, dear colleague, in what universe do you think micro breaks and multitasking are less effective than one fell swoop. I mean, aren't you taking a lot for granted? And you say, well, of course, coincidentally, men do things in one fell swoop. Do they really? Because a lot of the men I know who have chronic pain or who are older or who have hyperactive impulsive ADHD, they can only work in little steps. So if you take someone, I don't know, let's say a housewife with two toddlers, And you say, well, you aren't going to be as effective as you multitask. I'd like to know how you expect them to do anything else. And I think that's kind of really important that we focus a lot on this idea of staying focused on one thing at a time. And we somehow imply that doing micro projects followed by micro breaks is not as valuable. Now, there is something to be said for when you are highly distracted 
one way to manage distractibility is to make yourself stay focused on one project at a time. And you can use a timer for that. However, when you're doing that strategy, which is one I use all the time, I still only maintain my focus in increments of 15 minutes. I think you've heard me say that, that I very rarely stay with projects longer than that. The exceptions, of course, are when I'm seeing a patient. Those are 50 minute sessions and I'm fine with that. I'm very attuned to it. In fact, I have an internal timer now for the 50 minute mark. And also if I'm like watching something on Netflix and I'm knitting while I watch or something like that, sure, I may knit longer than that or crochet longer. When I'm doing color work, I may certainly go longer than one row or 15 minutes. Even so, I think that we have to be kind of interested in the fact that there's this kind of propaganda and certainly the self-help books promote this, that you should stay focused on one thing. And I find it very interesting that one of the great sages of American culture, Ben Franklin, is saying the opposite, that little strokes fell great oaks, that you do things in small increments. And that means what happens after you do something, you take a micro break. So thank you for letting me go on about that a little more, TST. I appreciated the comments. But I think it is important to realize the concept of micro breaks is kind of invisibly and I think very productively associated with doing things in small increments and then taking a break and then moving to something else. And that this kind of behavior is likely to increase with chronic pain or with disability or with aging. I don't think we should have a bias against using small increments of time, either for micro breaks or for micro projects to achieve something. On to the Fiber Retreat CFR 2023. The information thread is on Ravelry. There's a link to it in the show notes. We are on for Saturday, November 11th, 2023. We will have the event room from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. However, my schedule sounds like arrive Friday night the 10th probably at about 6.30 because I will be seeing patients beforehand and I have to do my charting and all that, make any phone calls, write reports, whatever. So I'm hoping to get there about 6.30-ish. That sounds about right. So I'm hoping someone will be hanging around to greet me and also to go to dinner with me. And, you know, that evening when we all come back or we all gather, those of us who are there on Friday night, hopefully we will get together in the common spaces. That They might have our conference room open, I'm not sure. They usually bill for any time you spend in it, boy. But there's also the lobby areas, the pool areas. We'll see what the weather is like, what the daylight and the lighting are like. Or maybe we'll just be meeting in somebody's room, whatever. Stay alert for notes in the lobby is what I would say. But hopefully we will be getting together on Friday night and enjoying each other's company just informally. Saturday, meeting at the pool at 9 a.m. We have some people coming in from out of town. So we want to make sure we're clear that the thing starts at 9 and what will be happening in the event room, the vendors will be setting up at 9. But we will probably be gathering around the event room and the pool, which are connected. And we will do what we normally do, the pool meeting, where I make any announcements, give a schedule. And also, we will do the raffles and we will do a go around the circle and say who you are sort of thing. I do plan to have name tags. 42 days away. Can you believe it? I can't. That's really scaring me right now. I'm just going to take a few deep breaths here. Use a few of my strategies. Meanwhile, the vendors are on. Everything is good. The vendors themselves, they pay for their participation by giving us, you know, items, one or more, to the retail, not wholesale value of $35. And that's what we're going to be raffling, along with some of the really cool things I have from Etsy people. The information on the Dizzy Blonde Studios colorway and the project bag and pattern by our own Brenda Castile, that is in the show notes and also on the info thread. We are waiting. We had an offer from Laser Sheep to do us a colorway. I'm assuming that's still on. I hope so. And as soon as I get a picture of that, I will let you see it. The schedule sounds something like 9 o'clock by the pool and then a chance to roam through the vendors. And then 10 o'clock, we're going to do our steaking class. I'm assuming that's about 10 to 11. After that, I'm going to do a meditation group. After that, we're going to have about a two-hour lunch. And when we come back from lunch, I think it's a lot more informal. We've had several offers to 
do sock classes. I'm kind of hoping we can lure Steffi Jo into this because I know she's a really good teacher. And in the meantime, we're also going to do the, we talked about having informal coaching, which we can set up at the meeting in the morning or maybe at lunch. You know, it might be worthwhile to just do a big sheet in the lobby or in the convention room that just says, my name is this and I'm willing to do this. And then people can walk up to it and say, I'd, I'd like to do that with you. You know, we might do something like that, like keep this really informal because I don't want it to suck up too much time in our meeting because I know you all want to shop. Let's be honest. And we want to do raffles. Let's be honest. Ugh, what's on my hooks and needles, you may be saying? I finished one of the socks in the BB-8 colorway in sock yarn by Laser Sheep, who will be one of our vendors. Yay! If you look at the picture, you can see... Now, my gauge is always a little off from Laser Sheep's, and I am not sure what that is, but it worked out pretty well once I got midway down the leg. I'm not sure what I was doing wrong before that, if I got tighter or looser. I always do an afterthought heel. Somebody was asking me about this, and... I picked a complementary yarn from my mini skeins because that's a thing I like to do because I tend to go through my heels faster than I go through any other part of the sock. And it's very easy for me if I use a contrast color to pick out the entire heel around the hole and just put on a brand new heel there. So that's why I do that. I Very rarely will I do the heel in the same color as the sock for the simple reason that when I wear through my heel, as I inevitably do, it makes it harder to replace the heel. This is one of the reasons I keep around my extra scraps of sock yarn. That a lot of them get used years later to be afterthought heels. Just telling you why we have that. But I'm loving that. This is a lovely yarn. It's got a beautiful hand. And it's just very cool and comfortable. I believe it's just a nylon uh, wool blend. But I'm enjoying the feel of this sock. I made it in my typical pattern, size 2, 64 stitch cast on. And I'm rather loving it. Meanwhile, still in progress, the stash toss, we are at 13 skeins in versus 58 out. Remember that I do not add to the count of skeins taken out of the stash until I finish the project. So, right now, I'm working on two sweaters and a pair of socks, and that in total probably accounts for about, boy, like 15 skeins more that are going to come out of the stash. I love this. This has been really satisfying. The only sweater's worth I am buying this year is from Lisa Souza, and that's because I want to make the Astraeus pattern by Bad Wolf Girl Knits, alias Megan Regan. I just want this ravishing set of dark blues with Faces of the Moon on it and the collar. I just think that's like the coolest thing ever. The Llama Love sweater, well, still on Sleeve Island. Last week, I got the sleeves down to the elbows in the beautiful foxglove pink by Lisa Souza. Then I started on one sleeve and did color work, adding the blue llamas that I love, as well as dots in the other colors, and it came out remarkably handsome. So right now I'm on the second sleeve and I'm trying to catch that one up. When I catch it up, I think both will be ready for their ribbing. I do, I think I do, I can't remember if I do two or four inches of ribbing. I need to look at my previous sweaters, but I want to look at this too because I am running low on the foxglove and I think I'm going to blend colors to make it go from pink to red there. So this is a design as you go, which I'm deeply enjoying and I'm so close to the finish line, I can taste it. I do have a lot of things to weave in. I haven't been weaving in as I go, which is rather unusual for me. But the Llama Love, it's very attractive. This is a great sweater, I'm really liking this. Meanwhile, I went back to the Superstition sweater because I just was going crazy getting through the 20 rows of color work that are devoted to the cats. I love the cats on this. They're arching their back with their eyes wide open, their tails straight up. Really sensational piece of design. I just love this. So I am finally finished those cats. After that, there's some solid work and then two separate peeries. I finished the first one, which is just white lozenges. And I'm moving on to the second one, which I'm adapting slightly because Megan put three colors in one line, which is a no-no for me when I do Fair Isle. I just don't like doing three colors in one line. Now you can do that, and she doesn't make it especially hard the way she's doing the pattern. It's very simple. I don't like doing it because I just think you have float mania on the back. Floats don't particularly intimidate me, 
but I just would really rather stick to the more conventional design, so I'm altering it a little bit. And of course you can see I've got one BB-8 sock finished and I am working my way down the two inches of ribbing at the top of the leg of the second one. I don't have a problem with second sock syndrome, I just never have. So that's going along very happily. I've probably got about six more rows of ribbing and then I can just get on to the mindless stockinette because I love me some mindless stockinette. I'm struggling to get through the neckline color work of the superstition sweater so that I can get onto the mindless stockinette in dark gray. I just like mindless stockinette. The whole point of sweaters is a month of mindless stockinette. At the same time, I'm kind of falling in love with color work, as you can see. In the meantime, not much else going on. I do have my references, the books and videos that I've used for these projects in the show notes. Dizzy Blondes, I am still brushing Minerva and saving her fur, but I haven't been spinning it. I'm saving up a big bag. Hopefully I'm going to find me some brushes or somebody's going to bring them to CFR and I'm going to brush out her fur and spin it. I'm hoping also to bring my Nano and to use that, to get that set up with whoever else wants to set up theirs and start spinning Minerva a bit on that. These electronic spinning wheels that come from the 3D printers, I have a harder time getting them to spin a really fine yarn. That's more on me, I think. So I'll probably get something a little more coarse out of Minerva there. And meanwhile, I want to blend this with some of my wool. I want to ply it, not blend it, with some of my wools that I've been spinning. So that's all somewhat in the future because I'm just not in the place of spinning. I'm pretty sure CFR is going to change that because we always spin our brains out at CFR. Strategy. This week, we got talking in therapy about ABC again. ABC comes from rational emotive behavioral therapy, a form of cognitive behavioral therapy. This one developed by Dr. Albert Ellis, who I had the privilege of training with briefly. Ellis was salty and brilliant, and a lot of what you hear as standard therapy. When you go to a medical doctor and they say, you should go get this kind of therapy, they're often talking about things based on Ellis's work. He's a very, very gifted man. One of the great things Ellis did for us was articulating this idea of ABC. And the core of this is, if you change your beliefs, you can change your life. This is a wonderful strategy because it lets you step around blaming and it lets you take responsibility, even if something is not your fault, for your own response and the changes you will make to protect yourself in future. That's really important. Now, a lot of times what you get in therapy is people come in and they're stuck. And it's because they are stuck. This person is doing such and such to me. And the inevitable response, the inevitable consequence of their action is I am stuck or I must do this wrong thing back that never works. They may not think of it as a wrong thing, but I'm saying it's wrong because they know it never works. And yet they keep on doing it. Now, in that world, people come into therapy and they are basically moving from A to C with no B. And A is an action and the C is the consequence, which they believe is inevitably and unchangeably caused by that action. Now, the action can be by the person who's stuck or it can be someone else in their life. But the key thing here is people come to therapy because they believe there is an action happening to them and they must inevitably and naturally respond in only one way. And some people know it. Some people realize they're saying there has to be a better thing to do, but I just can't figure it out. Some people don't. Some people come in and they just say, well, you know, uh, I have to come to therapy because this is going on in my life and it's just not fixable. Okay, and the answer is they are seeing it as some action leads inevitably to a consequence and now I can't get out of that and I'm stuck. And of course they are because they're missing the middle step. What's really going on is there is an action in their life. They have a belief about that action, and based on their belief, they make a choice of how to respond. Action leads to belief, leads to your choice. Now, when I say that, it's not always a winner. That you can look at lots of literary examples for an easy one here. Look at the Harry Potter books. Okay, Voldemort is evil and he starts killing people, and the good wizards believe that they have to stop them and they make a choice, some of them, to sacrifice their lives. I mean, ABC is a truth. It is not a model of how you win. 
It is a truth that your beliefs will affect your choices. And you may have to make a lot of painful choices in life. So please get the idea. If you come to therapy and you have this really challenging situation, um, my parent is dying. Look, you're going to lose your parent no matter what. But you can at least change your beliefs to make the best choices you can in that situation. Okay, so ABC, the reason this comes up is I keep seeing things on the internet that relate to this. And it's very odd because people do not seem to get that there are no win things in life. That sometimes the action that affects you is not an action that you can overcome or succeed with. And you have to choose the best way you're going to handle this. And then you make your choices based on that. And you can circle back to what we were saying earlier about chronic pain, micro breaks, and multitasking. That, in other words, action, I have chronic pain, belief, I can't do anything about it. So I sit around and I give up. Or action, I have chronic pain, belief, I'm going to have to find a way to continue my life as normally as possible, and this could be hard. Choice, I start getting help any way I can, consulting other people, and modifying my behaviors. Okay, so I'm coming back to ABC, I think, because that's in the back of my mind, because I've been training people on it this week, and it does keep coming up in therapy. And I think Tiny Shiny Things may have set me off a little bit, too, with her comment, because it really... I sent me off in a good way. She sent me down this avenue that when we talk about managing our lives, sometimes we have to realize what we're going to get is based on our beliefs about what is happening to us. And even when we handle things well, even when we recognize I can change my beliefs in response to an action in my life, it doesn't really mean that we're always going to win. It does mean, though, that we are doing the best thing we can by developing a range of options for ourselves by examining every possible belief. And I think that's really key, that your beliefs are going to dictate how you respond. Because I think when you get to the core of all therapy and all strategies in therapy, it's going to come down to your beliefs about your situation. One of the reasons cognitive behavioral therapy is so successful in terms of the research. Look, we have a lot of different types of therapy, but the one that consistently is best supported by research is cognitive behavioral. And I think this is the core of why. I think this is what Albert Ellis got so right. That if you come to therapy, you're coming to therapy because you believe somehow things can improve. And if you do that, if you're modifying your belief and coming to therapy, and coming to therapy can be very hard indeed, telling a total stranger all your problems, you know. But when you do that, you're basically embracing a belief that things somehow can be better. And that's sort of the, the wedge in your stuckness that the therapist is going to drive towards change, that we got a little wedge here, you're stuck, but you're not really. We can get an opening here, and in that opening, we can substitute new beliefs, and you can change. The interesting thing is, well, why is that so core in cognitive behavioral therapy? Well, first of all, cognitive thinking, thinking your beliefs, and it is. Your beliefs will affect your feelings and will affect your behaviors. So we do use a lot of behaviorism in COGB therapy because we are saying you can change your behavior. You can change the behavior of people around you, although you don't have a lot of control there. But you may be able to if you change your own beliefs and you change your own actions. So action leads to belief, leads to a choice. It doesn't always lead to a win, but it may lead to better options when you feel stuck. That's why we say go to therapy, that your beliefs have gone rigid. And you need some help broadening that. And when your beliefs change, you may get all sorts of positive feelings. You may get relief or you may get reality, but you also get a wider field of choices. And on to the fluffy books. Well, still in the Bridgerton books. Now I'm in the Smythe Smith Quartet. 
And in the second book, they make very clear that these Smythe Smiths, who spell their last names S-M-Y-T-H-E hyphen S-M-I-T-H. In the second book, they make very clear that the Smythe Smiths pronounce their last name Smith Smith. I was dying because I know that the author, Julia Quinn, knows what she's doing there, that she's taunting us with this. I have heard S-M-Y-T-H-E pronounce Smythe and Smith. I've heard it both ways. And I've heard it both ways on the other side of the pond in Great Britain. So I just think this is hilarious. And I have to tell you, these books are the real payoff of the series. That she's taking slightly bigger risks in the plots. And in the meantime, the humor in the Smythe Smith Quartet is so endearing. So I'm loving that. I'm not really reading anything else. I have been watching various dramas on Netflix. None of them have particularly moved me in ways that I should talk about. I did watch The King's Affection. I'm in the middle of it. I'm at like episode 11 of 20. As obvious, episodes 1 through 10 were kind of a series. And then 11 through 20, it's a bit of a reboot. And I don't know what to say about it. It's just a little bit weird. It's unbelievable. It's kind of engaging. It's about a girl being forced to play the crown prince throughout her childhood and then young adulthood. It's very, very interesting. And you just keep saying, how's everybody not realizing she's a woman? How are they pulling this off? And now they're getting to the touchy issue of what happens when the crown prince has to make a state marriage. So I can't say I really recommend this too much. I've just been floating around on Netflix, but not really settling on anything. Something I really like, well, I want to go back to dictation. I talked about this before. I've got a few things, really, so I'm just going to sort of wander around in this. The reason I'm turning back to the idea of dictation, I write notes on my computer, and now that I have this carpal tunnel in both wrists, not too badly, but I don't want to overdo it because I saved my wrist for crocheting and knitting in that order, I'm using dictation programs. And if you are on the... Windows platform on Word, you want to use Dragon Naturally Speaking because Windows has Cortana and it's it takes dictation, but just not well as far as I can tell. I've never been able to get any kind of smooth process there. If you're using an Apple and you're doing dictation, Apple's native dictation program works just fine. You press the little microphone to the left of the space bar on your keyboard on screen. And both of these programs are not perfect. You have to do a lot of editing and correcting, but it saves you from typing out everything and you can compose as you go and correct later. The reason I'm coming back to this is with the AI software that's now going everywhere, these are likely to get far, far better. And so I'm looking forward to the idea that both the Apple and the Cortana and Dragon Naturally Speaking, I should say both, I should say all three, are going to improve. So for those of you who want to dictate, remember that AI, if it all works out well, is only going to help you on this project. And I say this because if you have major projects and you're comfortable dictating, this is going to change everything and speed up a lot of your output. What I would tell you as a professional teacher of writing, because I am and have been, is you're going to have to learn to write before you learn to dictate. That dictation is really easy to get wrong, and it's really easy to let it run out of control because you're not used to the economy of the written word. So you're never going to get out of learning to write, and that's a good thing because learning to write has gotten me almost every meaningful thing in my life except my spouse and my son. But the other thing is, this is going to speed things up in a way that is comparable to the early 80s, where we had to write longhand and then type our papers for college. And then we just learned how to type right into the typewriter, which was miserable. And then we got computers and learned how to type without writing longhand eventually on our computer programs. And now I've taken the next natural progression is you learn to dictate. But dictation does change your style. At any rate, I want to sort of give you some encouragement that if you're doing a lot of writing, you want to look at dictation. Also, I have to say, as a user of an iPhone and a very outdated one, I use the original SE, and I have not had to upgrade it, which I'm extremely happy for. 
because I bought a huge amount of memory and it's working just great the way it is. And I dictate everything into my iPhone. I dictate my notes. I dictate any kind of reminder on the notes application or on my to-do list application. I dictate my text to people. I dictate everything. So something I really like the ability to dictate into computers and phones because it's only going to get better with the introduction of AI. Also, it is October 1st and today the mood hit me and I did make the first Keto Pumpkin Spice Earthquake Cake of Autumn. This has become a staple of our winter diet. We all like it. It's insanely delicious hot out of the oven. You let it cool for about 20 minutes. It comes out a little jiggly and that's what you want because it's really very pudding-like. Like it's a cake but with all the pumpkin in it and the liquid, you know, the egg in it, the butter and the pumpkin, it's a very buttery, puddingy type of cake. And then, of course, it's an earthquake cake. So you spread the frosting right onto the batter and it gets mixed in with it a bit. And you cook it that way with chocolate chips on the top to melt. Oh, heavens. I use keto chips from Lily's, by the way. But anyway, these things are wonderful, and so something I really like, we're back to pumpkin spice earthquake cake. Now, I also have discovered with my keto shakes, I've been mixing in a half spoonful of instant coffee in the morning and a few ice cubes, and my keto shakes have gotten really fantastic as well. Put a lid on it. Well, bless you, bless you, Pum Deluxe. They had a buy two and get 25% off sale. It was really something crazy, like buy one and get the second one half price, which means you're getting 25% off. I will always go for a sale if it's 20% of or more, if I have the money. So I have restocked on the watermelon mint, which I'm really thrilled about, because now I've got a lot of my watermelon mint and also of my tranquility peach. These are my two favorite herbals. I am very, very happy they did this sale. They are currently doing this month a sale on chai. I like chai, but I'll be honest, I'd rather make my own. And if you've never made homemade chai, you're missing out on something. Buying a pre-done mix, yeah, some of them are pretty good, but I'm not a big fan of somebody else's chai. On a cold evening, I want to brew my own chai with my own fresh spices and ground pepper. And it just has that strong, spicy flavor, and I don't think you can get it out of a mix. Now, meanwhile, you may remember that last week I was talking about the various low carb people on Instagram and Facebook and I'm sure TikTok who want to be influencers and all that. And I mentioned two of them and like I said, there are problems with them, but I did notice that both of them put up some recipes I liked. So I did take pictures. One is low carb Norma who did low carb chicken nuggets. And I've seen these before. I don't feel the real need to credit this to be honest, but I'm at least going to say her name in this because she gave me the latest version. This is a favorite in the keto community. You shred chicken, you mix in flour, eggs, and some cheese. In her case, she uses Parmesan. You'll see this with cheddar a lot. Something strong. You want a strong flavor to stand up to it. She uses rotisserie chicken, which of course will have spiciness in it if it's done well. But any kind of chopped chicken that you have left over, and then you're going to season it the way you like. Again, she uses Creole seasoning. I've seen taco seasoning. I just think any seasoning you like on chicken will go here. And she uses garlic powder, which I'm allergic to processed garlic powder, but I would consider putting in minced garlic here. And then some black pepper. Definitely, you mix it. You put it on a lined baking sheet. Spray it with oil, and then you're going to bake it. These make nice little nuggets. This is a really nice thing to have around. It goes great with the blue cheese dressing that I think I've given you the recipe for before, which is also keto enough. And then Keto Snacks put up Keto Broccoli Cheese Soup. Again, you see this all over the place. It's really a standard, you know, you're going to saute some onion. I tend to add my broccoli with it right away. He puts it in at the end. But you're going to add shredded strong cheese. We're talking about cheddar here. If you want it keto, do not buy pre-shredded cheese because they add starch to that. And then he, pick, he gives a nice standard sort of recipe. You're going to add heavy cream and maybe some crumbled bacon if you like it. And your base is going to be chicken stock, chicken broth. And you're going to have obviously chopped onion to, that you're going to saute to get everything going. And 
I like using minced garlic in this. I've seen garlic powder and all that, salt and pepper to taste. Really, you just saute your onion. And I would normally add the broccoli in and the stock and let it all cook together until it softens. And I'd put the cheese in last and then maybe bacon or chives, chopped onion, whatever you're using in there as a garnish. But, you know, this is really put it all in there and let it cook slowly. This is a great thing to do in a crock pot or a slow cooker. And this is one of those nice winter standards to warm everybody up. So I thought I would give you those two basic recipes, which are, they're all over the place in various formats. So these are taken from two of the influencers, but again, they're everywhere. On the blather, on the pup date, Captain and Queenie are happy because tonight we had steak bones. So even as I speak, they are in their crates, chewing on their bones, being really happy about it. Queenie with the one inch mouth was a little puzzled about how to handle a steak bone. I'm a little surprised. She's over a year old. I'm surprised this is the first one we've given her. Meanwhile, nothing going on much. Um, the Hubs and I are working on Project G very much together. He completely blew my mind because I thought he really didn't want to do very much of this. He went in there this weekend and in his style did a massive bunch of hours of work, which sort of threw the whole thing into chaos, the way I had it organized. But I have to say, he moved a lot of stuff and really identified a lot of stuff that is just trash. I mean, I've got a huge trash pile back where I had nothing, but the area closest to the kitchen door where we keep our tools and where we have the washing machines and the clothes to be sorted for laundry, he and my son cleaned that up. It looks so good, but now I have a lot of reorganizing of what I thought I'd already organized, but a lot of stuff is just going away. I am so happy about this. We're getting rid of 30-year-old stuff that should go. So that's lovely. I was throwing out just all sorts of things this week in public trash cans and recycling bins and all that. We do still have a surprising number of boxes left, but again, it was over 270 when I started three weeks ago. But this is good. And so he's been poking through the rafters and taking stuff off there because we have rafters in the garage where you can store things. Meanwhile, we had a lovely cold snap this weekend, and that explains, like, we had steak, and then we had pumpkin spice cake, and, you know, I'm, I'm eating soups and everything, because we had a cold snap this weekend, and you can see yesterday we decided to go out to dinner, because we were all tired, and it was in the 50s, and so there I am wearing one of my flannel skirts that I made myself, and my beautiful hand-knitted vest that I just love, and my beautiful hand-crocheted cardigan, you can't see the hand-knit socks, but it was so lovely. We went out to this restaurant, and everybody's trying to run around in, like, hoodies and shorts, and you can see everybody was freezing, and I just felt like, yes, yes, I am the knitter. Yes, I am wearing my art. And yes, I'm the only one in this restaurant who's warm and cozy. <laughs> and I just loved it. Project T goes onward. I am on my second journal. The first journal was my trip to Iceland, and I got through that, and now I'm just saving it to use up the pages for my to-do lists. Why buy new books when you can just use up these old ones? I'm on the first journal I wrote when I first went to Europe. I'm about a week into it. It's surprising how long this takes, but I don't usually get to do this every day because it does kind of disturb me in spots. And I realized I don't want nightmares on nights before I go to work the next day. Or I don't want, not nightmares per se, but sort of disruptive dreaming. I am surprised at this, but the memories are good, and it is very wonderful in its own way. Project Cookbook is staring her a bit, but it is going along, and it is rather shocking to go into the wooden recipe box and realize that there's quite a few cards in there now with recipes, so that's been very good. Today, since I made the spice cake, I did write that one up for Project Cookbook. My son is not all that interested. He's trying to be polite about it, but he's also taking more of an interest in cooking. And that's what I'm hoping for. Part of the logic is not to always be dependent on digital stuff for my cooking, because sometimes that's not convenient. I'd rather just take a bunch of these cards and, you know, wrap them in a rubber band and take them camping than try to take a computer and keep it running when I'm in a campground. I say this because when I last went to Yosemite, you couldn't get any internet. So if you didn't have it downloaded, you were in trouble. But I just have a sense that there should be cookbooks that are homemade and are part of the family's life and are not digital. 
So I'm enjoying that. The Green Fingers report, well, my goodness, there was another sale at Great Gardens, and I used it to buy more sage, more lavender, and more hyssop. The hyssop's a different subgroup, so the colors won't be purple. Uh, this time the flowers will be pink and yellow, but that's okay. The current sage is doing okay. The lavender is doing okay. The dianthus that I planted, there were three of them. One of them I think my son keeps stepping on, to be honest. I may have stepped on it too, for all I know. But one of them is just so happy. It's growing and it's flowering, and the other two are just kind of sitting there. My friend who has the green fingers thought none of the dianthus would work. I'm a bit surprised, really, that this one is working. But again, I buy them in threes. It's just an experiment. We'll see how it goes. The lavender and the Russian sage just look okay. They're not doing what the hyssop did. You'll see a picture of the blooming dianthus on the left in the show notes, or the first picture there. And then after it, you'll see the blooming hyssop, or the hummingbird mint. Now, the really exciting thing is this has worked way better than I thought in terms of pollinators and butterflies. We had two butterflies this week and I identified them, which sort of surprised me. And you can see a picture of one of them, the metal mark. I thought at first he was just kind of a washed out monarch. No, he's called a metal mark and he's a different subtype of butterfly. And they are around at this time of year. And this guy was around for a few days and he seems to be gone now. And then we have these beautiful whites with black spots near the top outermost tip of their wings and down towards their tail, slightly bluish tint. They are romantically called white butterflies. <laughs> but anyway, so we had a metal mark and we had a white. And so, yeah, it's true. If you build it, they will come. I'm very excited to see how this will go as we add to our collection of plants. So the new plants should be hitting October 5th, which means I should be planting them about a week from now. That's good because it's supposed to be in the 80s, so that'll be a pretty good time to do it. So again, this is all experimental to see if I can get anything set up. These things take two years to get established, so you've got to get started, however humbly. And I'm just doing them as I go, seeing what I get and seeing what works. On the calendar, our Santa Clarita Valley Free Craft Supplies Gathering will be at Canyon Country Park on Saturday, October 7th at 10 a.m. I was going to bring all these old rubber stamps, but I'm not sure I can get them out of the closet in time, so I'm now looking at other things I can move out of my space so that I have the space to get these things out of the closet. Meanwhile, Yarnopoly, my crocheting and craft group, they're meeting up Saturday, October 14th from 1 to 4. They meet at a Starbucks down in Santa Clarita. And there's another group, the second Saturday Stitchers meeting on that same day. And I'm not sure where and when, but I'm thinking about going down and meeting them. But my heart belongs to Yarnopoly. Rhinebeck West will be at the Knitting Tree down by LAX on Saturday, October 21st. I'm serious about going down, but I haven't done the homework on that. Of course, the Cognitive Fiber Retreat 2023 will be Saturday, November 11th at the Courtyard by Marriott in Valencia, just off the five. The Evolution of Psychotherapy Conference will be in Anaheim at the Anaheim Convention Center. I will be there from, I believe, the 14th through the 17th of December. So if you're going to come down to Disneyland that weekend or downtown Disney or you'd like to meet up, let me know. It would be fun. And of course, I have my Romeo vacation, which this year will be December 23rd through January 1st. I didn't put it on here yet, but I'm also taking Thanksgiving Friday off again. Just letting you know if anybody wants to meet up or knit. Minerva gets the last word. And there's a picture of her looking very smug because she did something rather shocking this week. I was walking down the hall to the back bedroom suite. And she was in the suite. I came around the corner. She saw me. She stretched with her forepaws out along the ground and you know stretched out her back end up in the air and she made asterisks out of her forepaws stretching all her toes and she looked at me and she said mom and I almost jumped out of my skin it really sounded like she just yelled mom at me and I I practically walked into a wall I was so startled because it sounded so intentional she has not done it since I have tried to push her into doing it and maneuver it, it's not working. But apparently, the last word from Minerva is, I could talk if I wanted to, you know. I just don't bother with you people. 
there you go. In the meantime, let me remind you that we are a community, which means when we take care of other people, we are taking care of ourselves. Just like when we care for ourselves, we are helping other people. Please keep in mind that things move in a circle like this. COVID is kind of ugly around here. About half my caseload has it. It is around. People aren't getting it in a life-threatening way so much, but it's definitely here. If you're coming to CFR and you want to mask, it's in your hands. So far, there's no regulations. But please, whatever you do, everybody, stay safe, take care of each other, and I will talk to you soon. Bye-bye. So we have come to the end of another episode of Cognitive. Please do not use this podcast to diagnose yourself. If you think you are having a mental health problem, please contact a licensed mental health professional. Show notes for these episodes can be found at cognitivepodcast, all one word, dot blogspot.com. Episodes can be found at iTunes under the name Cognitive Podcast, but also can be found posted next to the show notes on the Blogspot page. Thank you so much for listening. Everybody stay safe, take care of each other, and I'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye.